Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 10th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain our concerns about the governor's proposal this budget cycle to raise revenues through permanent PFD cuts without first exploring even obvious revenue alternatives the administration itself has raised. Second, we focus on a specific concern raised by former Governor Frank Murkowski, highlighted by the recent termination of Permanent Fund Corporation head Angela Rodell. And third, we discuss the positive outlook for current oil production levels outlined in a recent piece by Tim Bradner. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into uh, our weekly top three, and we're going to uh, start off uh, this morning with uh, revenues. Uh, $600 million in revenues that the DOR points out could be uh, gleaned in the state, but the governor seems reticent to take that it, that take that up. Instead, he's going to go into PFD cuts, and you have a take on this, and you're going to give us the details. Well, the more I dive into the budget, the more I'm realizing the governor's proposed FY23 budget in the 10-year plan, the more I'm realizing that there is a there's a disconnect of sorts in, in how this budget works. Um, the governor has proposed basically uh, five uh, – a PFD cut that's about 500 million in the current cycle over the 10 year period, it averages out at about 600 million a year. And that PFD cut is coming from the move from the statutory PFD to POMV 5050. Uh, now, some people think that isn't a change, but it is uh, in this respect. It changes how the inflation adjustment works. Under the statutory uh, appro approach, uh, the inflation adjustment is taken out of the government's uh, side, entirely out of the government side. Um, so when you look at the statutory PFD uh, over time uh, relative to the POMV draw, the statutory PFD works out to be about 65% because the government is having to bear the cost of the, uh, uh, of the inflation adjustment. Right. Um, it, it, under POMV 5050, that changes the inflation adjustment is split 50% between the government and 50% uh, between uh, citizens. And so POMB 50-50 is just that. It's, it's you know 50% of the POMB as opposed to the statutory formula, which gets you over time 65% of the, of the PFD. That difference between the two uh, is about, as I say, is currently about 500 million moving to 600 million. So the governor, by proposing to move to POMB 50-50, is proposing about a, a 500 to 600 million dollar uh, cut in the in what otherwise would uh, accrue uh, under the statutory provisions, and and of course this governor has said that that he's opposed to POMB uh, PFD cuts, so you know that raises an issue right there. But the other thing that I'm coming to realize, coming to focus on, is is the revenue uh, opportunities that. Uh, the administration itself put out there when it published its fiscal model um, in November. Uh, and you can go to the department; it, those interested can go to the Department of Revenue, click on the uh, uh, click on the fiscal model, which is linked on the first page. You have to have Excel. You have to have a Windows-based system and have Excel on it to be able to read it because it's a 
it's 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 built for <clears throat> built for Excel. Um, but once you read it, you and you <clears throat> excuse me, you click into it. You see you see a list in the in the lower left hand side. You see a list of of revenue alternatives, and they are they they vary from they range from things like um, correcting what's called the Hillcorp issue. Uh, in our corporate income taxes, BP paid corporate income taxes. Hillcorp doesn't uh, because of its corporate form, and so Hillcorp's missing about sixty, or the state's missing about sixty-five million dollars a year on average uh, of revenues uh, that BP used to pay. That Hillcorp, simply because of its corporate form, uh, doesn't. Uh, and it ranges from things like that, a slight increase in the motor fuel tax, um, carbon offsets, a change to uh, uh, the uh, 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 corporate income tax to to reach highly digitized businesses. We don't uh, tax uh, uh, businesses that are essentially online businesses uh, reaping the benefit of Alaska's uh, of, of their reach into Alaska. We don't tax them uh, at all um, at, at a state level, and uh, an adjustment uh, to the corporate income tax uh, would do that. Sort of treat them like the oil companies in the sense of what they're. Uh, uh, the benefits they're realizing from Alaska. Uh, it, it ranges from things like that. In total, it also includes the sales taxes that uh, that Mike Shower and others have talked about. Mike Shower and Shelley Hughes have talked about. Uh, the, 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 it has an option for the South Dakota, essentially the South Dakota form. It has an option for essentially the Wyoming form. In total, if you, if you add them all up, uh, they get close to a billion dollars in in a revenue, but but even the even you know taking the things like oh there's also an oil tax adjustment in there, um, but even taking things like the Hillcorp uh, uh, adjustment and the and the corporate income the extending the corporate income tax to uh, uh, digital uh, entities online entities uh, would uh, raise a significant uh, share of revenue. So we've got a situation where the governor is proposing a PFD cut by converting from the statutory PFD to POMV 5050. But in, in, his, in his budget, though the Department of Revenue shows these options in his budget, he's not proposing any of these, of these revenue addbacks uh, that, would, that would reduce the size, the needed size uh, of, the, uh, of the PFD cuts. So I, this is something I'm sure is going to get explored more uh, during the session, but it's it's something that is 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 troubling to me. I mean, I don't I don't understand why the governor is doing PFD cuts, putting the burden uh, on the back of Alaska uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, putting this 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 tax burden, PFD cut burden, on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families, and he's not doing anything. Even the simplest thing, like fixing the Hill Court uh, uh, issue, uh, proposing to do anything, like even fixing the the simplest thing, like the like the Hill Corp adjustment uh, on the uh, on the other side, and and I and it's it's a it's a disconnect uh, that troubles me. Is is the governor so anti revenue uh, that he's willing to allow Alaskans to take another hit in terms of making? PFD cuts permanent by moving to POMB 5050. Right. Is he so anti-revenue that 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 he's willing to put it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families and not do anything uh, to offset that in terms of other revenue? Well, uh, let me play devil's advocate on that because have, having had these conversations with both the governor and, for example, Mike Shower in regards to moving to POMV instead of the statutory formula, um, the the consensus is, and especially from Shower, is that there is just no political will to even discuss the statutory uh, formula, that it is essentially dead in the water, and that this was the compromise that they could find that at least maybe they could get enough horsepower behind to uh, you know to to take on and do and something was better than nothing a little bit more was better than all of it or something along those lines so I mean what do you say to to that I mean is that factoring into this or do you just see it as uh, you know why would you give it up when there's all these other options on the table well the 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 reason that the POMV cuts are out there uh, the PFD cuts excuse me the reason the PFD cuts are out there is because. Uh, the the sense is the sense is they need revenue in order to in order to maintain spending levels and the PFD is the easiest place uh, to go get it. I I I understand that, 
But if you have other revenue options uh, like um, uh, uh, the Hill Court fix or like uh, extending the corporate income tax to include digital uh, digital businesses, highly digital businesses, uh, or like uh, a slight change in the motor fuel tax, tax or, or like those things, why don't you pursue those? I mean, so so the goal in the in the legislature, the reason people are pursuing P PFD cuts is to is to gain revenue. Why don't you pursue those alternative revenue uh, measures, those substitute revenue measures that would take the pressure uh, off the off the PFD? I I understand I understand why you go to POMV fifty why you go to POMV fifty fifty if you if you've got no other alternatives because you know the the pressure's on to to maintain those revenues behind uh, uh, behind spending levels to to maintain those spending levels. But why do you not pursue alternative revenue measures to help fill that gap and take some of the pressure uh, uh, off the off the PFD? That's that's the question that I that, that's not making not making sense to me, particularly since the administration itself is the source of 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 the information about what I mean. They're, they're the ones that put it out there. Right. Is the source of what the additional revenue, uh, uh, the substitute revenue would be. Right. It's their plan, and he's steering the boat, and he's laying the plan down for them to pick apart. Why wouldn't he at least include those, I guess is what you're saying, in the options for the legislature to take up? Yeah, exactly right. And, and you know, and, and at least highlight that we don't need to be taking uh, this level of PFD cuts uh, and and at least force those who say, oh, we shouldn't do the Hill Corp, we shouldn't fix the Hill Corp problem. Uh, or we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, tax highly digitized businesses in the same manner that we that we tax other corporations. Um, at least force those who make that argument to make the argument publicly, and explain to Alaskans why those businesses or or those you know tax breaks essentially in the case of Hillcorp certainly uh, those tax breaks are more important. Uh, than uh, than than putting money in the pockets of Alaska families through uh, through the PFD. We're, we're, uh, by not putting that on the table, he, we're essentially he's essentially not opening up that debate. He's not he doesn't want to have that. I mean, the, the the net effect of it is he doesn't want to have that debate about why the Hill Corp exception, for example, that's a hundred bucks a family. It's not hundred bucks a PFD rather. I mean, it's not it's not trivial. Why? Why fixing the Hillcorp exemption isn't, or the Hillcorp issue, isn't a, isn't better than than making another you know sixty million dollars cuts in the in the PFD. I I just don't understand if, if the priority it's a question of priorities. If the priority is the PFD and maintaining the PFD, then then why aren't we doing taking the steps appropriate to maintain the PFD? Why are we letting these other revenue options, even the even the easy ones like the Hill Corp fix, why are we letting these reven these other revenue options <clears throat> slide off the table and taking PFDs instead? Well, wait a second, Brad. You're an oil company shill. Why would you advocate for taxing uh, Hill Corp? Uh, I mean, you know, that's a... <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, okay, I'm sorry. That was a little tongue-in-cheek on me there. Uh, Terry says, Hill Corp is not the problem. Thankfully, they're drilling. I don't think... Don't hear what Brad's not saying. I don't think you're saying that they're the problem, Brad. You're just saying in the equitability in the playing field, I mean, BP was paying that tax and this company is not. You're not saying that they're a problem. You're saying that they're one tool in the tool shed, right? Yeah, it's, it's I, mean, I mean, here's the deal. Uh, BP was was a in a corporate form that was covered by the uh, the state's corporate income tax. It is, it, it's an income tax that applied to BP. It applies to Exxon. It applies to Conoco. Um, it applies to Repsol. It applies. It, it applies to most of the other corporate forms operating in the state, because Hillcorp is structured slightly differently, um, and and frankly, in a form in a corporate form that didn't exist, I don't think at the time that the corporate income tax was passed, because Hillcorp is structured slightly differently, they're not subject to the corporate income tax, and so they're not paying. They're not filling the hole uh, that that was created when BP left the state. The, the Hillcorp stepped into BP's role, um, but Hillcorp isn't paying the same, isn't isn't the same tax burden. They aren't paying the same corporate income tax that Conoco's paying. They aren't paying the same corporate income tax that that uh, that Exxon's paying and and the other corporations operating on the North Slope are paying. Essentially they've got a they've got a loophole that they're 
that they're fitting through. I that's you know this isn't anti Hillcorp. This is let's just make our corporate tax treatment apply to to all of the corporations that are uh, operating uh, uh, operating in um, in the state. All the old corporations that are that are operating in the state and not let a slightly different corporate form allow one of those corporations to slip through and not bear the the tax burden that the others are. Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think that if it, uh, if it's, you know, good for the goose, good for the gander, I don't think it's a problem to, uh, to have that discussion at, uh, you know, at all, uh, at that point, let me go back here to see what else, uh, uh, Terry says people are not going to like this, but the oil companies are not social services. They're here to make money. They are private corporations. If we tax them to death, they will be gone. Find somewhere else to drill that is cheaper. Um, is the thing. And that's always been the balance, right, Brad? I mean, the balance has always been to find a way to get the maximum return for the people while at the same time not making it unattractive for oil exploration and development and everything else. But, I mean, you and I have had that conversation. Even then, there is still some room left at the table. Yeah, absolutely. You want to you want to keep the incentive to, to drill here. And, and I've talked a lot about that in the past. Uh, but But at the same time, if you are keeping the incentive to drill here, and and they're making and they're making a little bit more than that, um, uh, you don't need to over incentivize drilling here. I mean, from from Governor Hammond on through, all the way, you know, from Governor Egan on through, uh, it has been the, the 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 tension point is to get the most you can out of Alaska's resources without uh, without taking away the incentive for corporations to be in Alaska. That's a balance, and that balance changes over time. It was there was incentive enough. There's incentive enough for Conoco to be in Alaska to continue drilling in Alaska, even though they're paying corporate income taxes. I don't. I I don't have. I, I can't comprehend how it's okay for Conoco to pay corporate income taxes, but somehow we have to give Hillcorp a tax break, uh, in or a, a corporate ta- a tax break in order for them to operate in the in the state. The the revenue measures in the um, in the in the Department of Revenue fiscal model include changing the oil taxes, uh, and and they they change the oil taxes by reducing the adjustment mechanism that's currently in the oil taxes from an adjustment of eight dollars a barrel sliding scale of starting at eight dollars a barrel and reduce that by by three dollars a barrel that raises about four hundred million dollars. There's a debate to have whether that adjustment uh, is, is whether all of that adjustment or some part of that adjustment is appropriate or not uh, to, uh, in, consistent with keeping the incentive to, to drill in Alaska. But it's a debate to have. I mean, what the governor is essentially doing is deciding not to have that debate, uh, not, not raising what his own Department of Revenue, not raising an option his own Department of Revenue puts on the table in the fiscal model, the governor's saying, I, I don't want to have that debate. I want to cut the PFD instead. And that's, I, let's have the debate. I mean, let's have the discussion. I've got opinions about it. Other people have opinions about it. Legislators will have opinions about it. Oil companies will have opinions about it. But let's have that discussion. Let's just not say, well, we don't need, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, deal with that issue. We're just going to make P, PFD cuts instead. There's a tension there. And we need to have a discussion about that about that tension, we need to find the sweet spot, the landing spot uh, in that discussion, as opposed to just wipe it off the table. I mean, the, the Hillcorp, the Hillcorp corporate tax issue is 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 the most blatant uh, of the issues. Look, Conoco's paying the tax, Exxon's paying the tax, BP used to pay the tax, uh, uh, everybody else is paying the tax up there except for Hillcorp. What justifies? Hill Corp getting a tax break that no other corporation still on the slope is getting. I think it's a valid point, and I appreciate uh, you bringing it up. You've seen some of the pre-release bills, I'm assuming, that came out on Friday. And, of course, there's another batch that's going to be coming out this Friday. Uh, Any predictions or any kind of uh, hint at what you think is going to be happening in the session as it kicks off this next Tuesday? I'm I'm not seeing anything in the pre-release bills that really – uh, really surprised me or, or removed me a lot on the fiscal or oil side. You, you got to, we have to remember that we're in the second year of a two year session. And so all of the bills that were in the previous session carry over uh, to this session. And, and a lot of the movement on fiscal issues 
um, uh, the I Ivy Sponholtz bill, for example, that uh, that they came with at the end of the at the end of the last special session uh, on from uh, House Ways and Means uh, that that cuts the PFD permanently and and takes that money and puts it over to dedicates it to a K through 12 education. Those are the bills that I think are going to be the important bills from a fiscal side uh, as we as we come into this session. So there's nothing in the pre-release that really uh, uh, has caught my attention uh, uh, one way or the other. It's the continuation of the bills from the last session, I think, that are important. There's some speculation that uh, the, the, the big push will be to try and immediately get the budget out and to get it out quick and early to avoid some of the parliamentary procedures that would give some power to the minority and being able to hold hostage effective dates and everything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some speculation that they wanted to get it done in less than 90 days, not only so they could get out and start campaigning, being that it's a big campaign year for everybody, but because they don't want any pushback and they don't want to give the minorities any levers to be able to use against them on this. We were assured by Peter Machicki that, well, that really wasn't what he wanted to have done. But what, what what's your thought on that as you look at this? Well, I mean, you always want to get the budget out. You always want to get it off the off the table if you if you if if you can for for a lot of reasons, uh, but you have to have an agreement on it. <laughs> and um, and I and I don't know. I you know it. What whether you do the budget early or late, it's always subject to various maneuvers. There's going to be an issue about the clause that that deals with uh, uh, the carryover of uh, of of funds. Um, and and I. Yes, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of push, a lot of desire to get it done early, but you're going to have to you're going to have to go through the procedural hurdles one way or the other. And if you want to go through them early, great, uh, that that would be fine. Uh, but you're going to have to go through them, and uh, and and I don't think that uh, I, I what what happens with a budget is people want to get it done early. They push, they they sort of push to get it done early, and then it sort of bogs down and it just sits there as people try to reach agreement. Uh, on various uh, various pieces of it, and then it gets pushed to the end of the session because they haven't reached agreement on it, and they suddenly need to re reach agreement on it uh, before the end of the session. And I I don't I don't see forces at work that are going to change that sort of dynamic uh, that dynamic this session. That they may want to get it out early, but there may sure. be things and forces arrayed against them that don't allow that to happen. Is essentially what you're saying. Going back to the first part, I, I think we need to have a discussion about various decisions that are being made sort of off the table or under the table, if you will, or, or behind the table, wherever you want to put them, decisions that are being made about not to pursue certain revenue sources uh, and to take it out of take it out of the PFD instead. I mean, the Hill Corp is the, the Hill Corp fix, the Hill Corp issue on the corporate income tax is is the most blatant, I think, of all of them. But there's, I mean, the Department of Revenue uh, 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 fiscal uh, uh, model raises a number of, of revenue issues, even before you get to you know personal taxes. Raise a raise a number of, of revenue uh, potentials to to get additional revenue on the table from traditional sources, uh, and not do PFD cuts. But we aren't having that discussion, and and that's very frustrating. I think should be very frustrating to those who are concerned about middle and lower income Alaska families, those who are concerned about the overall Alaska economy. And maintaining the PFD, it should be frustrating that we're not having a discussion about looking to other traditional potential sources uh, to help fill those gaps instead of just immediately knee-jerking going to going to PFD cuts. We need to have that, that discussion on the table with all Alaskans involved as opposed to those decisions being made uh, in the back room. Especially, when, especially since they have actually laid those options out on the table. I mean, right? It's not like they're out there searching for things. They actually have a whole laundry list of things that could be addressed, but they just put them in the plan and then they basically put them in the plan and then don't talk about them. Uh, or not put them in the plan, but put them on the planner, I guess I should say, as options and then don't incorporate them in any of the proposals that they put forward. And don't explain why they and don't explain why they don't. I mean, they just go to PFD cuts. The administration has just gone to PFD cuts, permanent PFD cuts. Uh, instead, so I, it's it's a discussion that that the administration just seems to have skipped over, and for a governor who says he prioritizes the PFD, it's a very odd discussion to have skipped over. Right. I mean, if, if you're prioritizing the PFD, let's do that, 
and let's talk about other ways to keep the PFD uh, uh, at, uh, at statutory levels or near stat current statutory levels. Let's talk about those other ways. Instead, he's just skipping over it, going straight to the PFD cuts uh, and ignoring obvious revenue raisers like uh, obvious revenue measures like uh, like the Hill Court fix. All right. Well, that's number one. Number two, give me a quick tease. 60 seconds. We're going to take a break, but give us a tease for number two, which is a discussion on maybe there is a reason that Angela Rodell was fired that nobody knows about. Uh, what is the effect on the permanent fund in the future? Hit me with that real quick. So there's a there's a op-ed piece by Frank Murkowski, at least in the uh, Kenai Peninsula Clarion, uh, perhaps in other papers by now, uh, talking about the firing of Angela Rodell. And I, I, I started reading it because I, and, and frankly didn't have much expectation because I thought it would just be another sort of rant about, you know, the Permanent Fund Corporation Board needs to explain uh, why they fired her, which we've seen from a lot of people. This one, however, has a different angle on it. Uh, and I think an important angle uh, that uh, that I want to talk about uh, as part of the uh, second segment. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're going to uh, continue with him here on the weekly top three. We're on to number two, talking about the termination of Angela Rodell. Uh, let's uh, let's see what uh, what you had to say about that. There was a piece by Murkowski, an opinion piece, which you thought was going to be run of the mill and the same, but instead it brought up. Some important points, Brad. Uh, continue on. I've been hearing uh, the, the the speculation at the time <coughs> of Angela's dismissal. The speculation at the time was that she was dismissed because she was she was opposing uh, the use of an excess uh, ERA draw to help the governor uh, bridge uh, deficits that that, he, that the budget would be facing over the next several years. Um, and and that it, and that she was dismissed because of her uh, opposition to that. It turns out the governor isn't using that ERA bridge financing in his budget. He's using a combination of higher oil prices, uh, which produce uh, higher than higher traditional revenues than anticipated, and uh, federal and converting some federal funds, some some COVID relief funds, uh, over to uh, the state budget, which he's entitled to do. Um, uh, to, to fill the budget gap. He's not use, using this ERA bridge draw that some speculated uh, was the motivation behind uh, Angela's termination. Murkowski, Frank Murkowski, raises uh, the prospect of a different issue that I've heard other people talk about uh, behind Angela's uh, 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 termination. And that is this recent move that the, that the permanent fund has made to take a part of the permanent fund uh, investment fund and put it into Alaska projects, state projects, give you focus part of the fund uh, on Alaska projects. I've been a critic of that, as have others, uh, since the permanent fund started going down that road a couple of, of years ago. We have an investment fund for Alaska projects. It's ADA, the Alaska Industrial Development Authority and Export Authority. Um, and that's the, that's the state arm that's supposed to be concerned about investing in Alaska projects. The permanent fund is supposed to be over here getting the best return it possibly can uh, on our dollars. And the concern has been starting the permanent fund down the same road as ADA, putting it, making funds available to in-state projects raises the prospect of politics getting into the, into the issue uh, and, and preferential treatment of some Alaska projects uh, over others and some prospect of, Alaskans, uh, Alaska projects uh, uh, not panning out, uh, uh, losing money or not getting the, the money that could have been received for by the permanent fund if they had invested uh, elsewhere. Um, and Murkowski raises, raises the issue that that's the issue, raises, raises the, the prospect that that's the issue that got Angela terminated, that she's been pushing back on this diversion of permanent fund uh, assets uh, over to state projects, given a preference over to state projects, um, and uh, 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 that she's been pushing back on that, and that that's the issue that she that she got terminated for. Some of that makes sense because the 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 person behind pushing those in-state projects has been Craig Richards, who's the chairman of the Permanent Fund Board. He's the one who's pushed increasingly over the years to use the permanent fund to fund in-state projects. At one point, 
Craig was was pushing the, the the proposal to use the permanent fund to fund the oil and gas tax credits uh, that the state still owes to uh, smaller producers from the old oil and gas uh, uh, reimbursable tax program back in the in the 20 teens. Um, and and Craig has consistently pushed taking a portion of the permanent fund, at least taking a portion of the permanent fund, and putting it over to Alaska uses. Um, and 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 Craig was the one that announced. Uh, Alaska or uh, Angela Rodell's termination. So I think I think <clears throat> the Murkowski piece is useful for surfacing uh, an issue that I think deserves a lot of attention, even if that wasn't the reason for the termination of, of Rodell. We need Alaskans need to be taking, I think, a serious look at using a portion of the permanent fund to fund Alaska projects. Because that, to me and others, raises the, the prospect that now we're going to start using the, the, the permanent fund to pay off political favors. Some Alaska, some Alaska project wants, a, uh, wants, a, wants funding, can't get it from ADA, uh, can't get it from the traditional source uh, of funding. And so they go convince the permanent fund that, oh, we really ought to be putting funds into this project using political power to, uh, to do that. I think that's a very, very bad road to start down. It's a road we've started, uh, and even if that wasn't the reason for Angela's termination, uh, it's a it's it's a road that needs to be examined. The hearings on Rodell's termination start next Monday. Uh, LBNA Leg Legislative Budget and Audit is uh, conducting those hearings. Uh, they're scheduled to uh, the hearings begin next Monday. We'll see uh, we'll see what those hearings produce. But I think Frank Murkowski in this piece uh, raises an issue that. Uh, that, that ought to be probed in those hearings and, uh, and indeed maybe beyond those hearings uh, uh, as, a, as a way of curbing a direction that the Permanent Fund Board seems to be headed in. And in a quick 60-second synopsis, of, I mean, you've, you've hit on some of the reasons why the uh, usage of the Permanent Fund itself to invest in Alaska may not be a great idea, but predominantly the answer is because the the job of the permanent fund is to generate the maximum revenue back right to the state and that they shouldn't get involved in the interstate stuff because again it is subject to political influence that's that's the main you know uh you know breakdown here for people who don't understand exactly what you're getting at yeah exactly right all right. Well, that moves us on here. We got about three minutes, so we'll move on to number three, which is North Slope oil production and pricing. Looks like production is holding steady. Uh, pricing, of course, is always kind of up in the air. It's it's a it's a give and take. But what's uh, what's your final take here on the current level of production, and where does it go from here? Well, we've seen we've seen uh, uh, the new project production forecast come out as part of the uh, Department of Revenue's uh, fall. Uh, uh, revenue forecast. Tim Bradner has a has a piece on it in the Anchorage Press or in the Anchorage Press, uh, and I think it's probably also in the Frontiersman uh, about sort of doing a deeper dive into that production forecast. Um, and it looks like, uh, based upon at least in the near term, uh, it looks like uh, uh, slope production is uh, is holding its own uh, against uh, what some uh, have been concerned about in the past, including me. Uh, a potential decline. Uh, Prudhoe is staying relatively steady, which is uh, 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 a good sign. I mean, large fields uh, uh, late in life go into decline. Prudhoe has been in decline, but now it seems to be plateauing again uh, and uh, seems to be holding steady. Uh, Tim talks about two new sources of supply that are coming on uh, this fiscal year that are, that are raising, uh, supporting uh, a slight increase in uh, in the production forecast for this fiscal year, FY22, and then on into FY23, uh, above what uh, above what was expected, certainly in the last uh, in the spring forecast, uh, well, no, in the fall forecast uh, last year, um, and so it, it's a it's a it's a good review. Tim's piece is a good review. If people are interested in what's going on in the North Slope, Tim's piece is a good review of what's going on with uh, production levels and uh, and sources of supply coming on longer term. I think we still we still have a big issue. Longer term, we're counting on Pika, and we're counting on uh, uh, on uh, Conoco's efforts uh, 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 at Willow and elsewhere. Uh, those those are you know those longer term uh, sources are are still subject to question. I think, uh, but near term, it looks like production's holding up, and that's that's a good thing. 
what does it mean for Alaska with production remaining steady, pricing, you know, again, where it's going in the future? We got about a minute and a half here. Give me your final thoughts on that. Well, it, it means that the fall off in, in traditional revenues uh, that, I, that, that, that you usually expect as older fields go into decline, lower production means lower revenues, that that fall off in revenues from the production side um, uh, is, is not as uh, pronounced is not as likely as I think uh, as I think uh, some were concerned about, and and with oil prices now sort of escalating back to the eighty dollar at least in the near term, and holding steady at the at that level at least for the last couple of weeks, uh, it looks like uh, the FY twenty two revenue picture is going to be even a little bit better, frankly, than the administration forecast and the fall forecast, and it looks like the FY twenty three. Uh, revenue level is going to be a little bit stronger than uh, than the administration has been has been recently forecasting. So it's a good thing in the near term. It's a combination of prices firming again uh, and production staying uh, staying at uh, at, at relatively uh, uh, flat levels, if not increasing a little bit. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him at ak4sb.com. You can also find him on Facebook, where he's more than willing to argue with you about stuff there as well online. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.